Welcome, everybody, to this uh, Burton K. Wheeler lecture. I'm Bradley Snow. I'm the chairman of the Burton K. Wheeler Center Board. Uh, we're very excited to be doing a lecture here tonight. Sorry about the weather, uh, but thanks for coming out despite the inclement conditions. Uh, it's my pleasure to uh, have my father here uh, speaking to you all tonight on, on an issue that is unfortunately more timely than I think we want it to be. Uh, we're going to be having the Wheeler Center, uh, as many of you know, is a public policy center that focuses on Montana issues. We're the only such center in the state of Montana. We've been doing our work, uh, public lectures and conferences and economic roundtables and other types of programming for over 20 years now. And uh, we look forward to a, hopefully a long uh, future in the state doing these kinds of, this kind of work. Um, and uh, we will be doing a conference in late March or early April. We don't have the date worked out yet, but it'll be on campaign finance issues. That conference will be in Helena. Uh, watch our website, stay tuned for the exact date and location of that conference. Uh, and we should be getting that up on the website probably within the next uh, few weeks. So stay tuned for that. That'll be in the spring. Uh, and uh, without further ado, I'm gonna hand the microphone over to our new executive director, Dr. Eric Austin. Instrumental in 
um, doing a lot of the advertising, uh, helping me with the logistics, and so thank you to them. Um, we have a brand new administrative assistant um, who we threw to the fire, uh, starting out in the last couple of days, but has been helping out with this process as well. Samantha Becker has been really useful here and very helpful also. Brad mentioned um, a minute ago, uh, we have an upcoming conference this spring. It will be in Helena late, uh, late March, early April. Stay tuned for that. Um, we are also working to do some additional lecture events, um, and those are sort of brewing in development. And so I'm just going to kind of uh, you to, to look back to our website. I can tell you they are going to be very exciting, but I can't tell you anything more than that. So check back to the website. We also have a sort of reactivated Facebook page. If you are on Facebook, please like us. <laughs> if you have a Facebook page, check that out. Um, we'll be pushing information out that way as well. Um, let's see. Let me say one word about the uh, format this evening, and then I will turn the mic over to, to Bob Brown. Um, Dr. Snow will be speaking for a while. Um, we'll let him decide how long he wants to go. Um, and then we'll do some question and answer afterwards. Um, we are, some of you have probably noticed, we are capturing the video for this evening's event as well as the audio. Um, we will be posting this. Actually, the first thing that will happen with that is that it will be broadcast um, through TVMT, through the PBS um, station that broadcasts the legislative sessions. Um, well, as soon as we know when that's going to happen, we'll post that information as well. But the more important attribute, or the more important aspect of that is that the only way we will catch your questions is if you have a microphone in your hand. So when we get to the Q&A, raise your hand, we'll get this microphone to you, that way we can capture that audio. So just be aware of that. Um, we'll have lots of time for Q&A uh, a little bit later in the evening. Um, so having said all of that, I'm going to get myself out of the way here, and I'm going to turn the microphone over to a fixture of Montana politics. Uh, Bob Brown. Well, thank you. You know, uh, I spent four years here, 43 years ago. <laughs> and when you come back to the place where you went to college, you've got all these wonderful memories, and you're always reminded of when you're here. This is kind of a cold, snowy day, of course. It reminded me of the experience that I had here probably 42 years ago, or 44 years ago. Uh, I lost my pants betting on the football team. <laughs> and it was between the Cats and the Grizzlies. And the loser had to give his pants to the winner on the 50-yard line of the football. <laughs> Can you imagine making a bet like that? It was a competitive game, but anyway, they beat us by something like two or three points, I think, they used for the field goal. And it runs vaguely in my mind that we had missed a field goal earlier in the game kicked by Jan Stenner, who went on to professional football playing, you know, but he sure let me down that <laughs> Anyway, I know I've been going over this this afternoon, we've been reading that experience, but it's all part of the great college experience that I did have here. Well, uh, it's a pleasure to, as a member of the Board of Trustees of the Wheeler Center now, it's a pleasure to have the opportunity to come back here again. And uh, I'll be able to do it, I think, more often now, or at least I hope to be able to, uh, in, the, in, the, in the months and the years to come. And it's certainly a pleasure this evening uh, to welcome you to the 2013 Wheeler Lecture. Uh, for those of you who don't know who Burton K. Wheeler was, there's a book that was written some years ago, it's an excellent book called Yankee from the West, that tells you about him. And we've had some, <coughs> some distinguished U.S. senators in one of the but I don't think we've ever had any more courageous than Burke K. Wheeler. And the fact that his center is located here on this campus is a wonderful thing for, for Montana State University, and I'm pleased to be associated with it. And our, our speaker this evening, uh, former Secretary of the Treasury, John Snow, this is unique, I know, in the, in the, in the Wheeler Lecture Series, is the grandson-in-law of Burke K. Wheeler. He married Burke K. Wheeler's granddaughter. And the guy you just heard a couple of speakers ago, Bradley Snow, is his son, who would be Peter's great grandson. So, right here in the same room on the same night, what an interesting coincidence connected directly to Burton K. Wheeler. Uh, John Snow, uh, 
Uh, he's an accomplished economist, an academic, uh, a CEO. He was born in Toledo, Ohio. Uh, he was the 73rd uh, Secretary of the Treasury of the United States, and he's an influential figure in the United States as well as in the global community. During his tenure as Secretary of the Treasury from February 2003 until June of 2006, under President George W. Bush, the Honorable John Snow led the Bush administration's economic team and was its guiding voice uh, on domestic and global economic issues. He steered the effort to pass the historic 2003 Jobs and Growth Tax, Jobs and Growth Tax Relief Act, a signature achievement which significantly lowered tax rates on individuals as well as on capital investment, leading to a strong economic recovery enjoyed during that period. Prior to becoming Secretary of the Treasury, Mr. Snow held the position of Chairman and Chief Executive Officer of global transportation company CSX Corporation for more than a decade. He also held several high-ranking positions in the Department of Transportation during the Ford administration where he led efforts, where he led the efforts to deregulate the motor carrier airline barge and rail uh, industries. Uh, Secretary Snow did his undergraduate work at Kenyon College and the University of Toledo, receiving his Bachelor of Arts degree in 1962. Uh, he went on to earn a PhD in economics from the University of Virginia, as well as a law degree from George Washington University. He serves on the boards currently of Marathon Petroleum Corporation, Lender Processing Services Incorporated, Amada Hoffler Properties Incorporated, and the International and International Consolidated Airlines Group. So he remains very much involved, highly respected, uh, it's my great pleasure and honor to introduce to you Secretary of the Treasury, John Snow. Samantha's turning me on here. Bob, thanks for that, uh, for that great, uh, great, great introduction. I, I feel very comfortable here for a number of reasons. Some of the ones, uh, the, uh, some of which are the ones you mentioned, you know, being back in a classroom. Uh, when uh, Bradley was a little boy, uh, I had to get up at about 6.30 or 7 o'clock to go out to the University of Maryland at, uh, for an 8 o'clock course in Introductory Economics, the Foundations of Economics, or some title like that. And it was an auditorium like this. It had 500 students in it. And I was 24, 25 years old, and I was petrified that uh, I'd fall flat on my face and that uh, the students would decide there's no point in going to those lectures. Uh, we'll just put a tape recorder at the front of the room, and there'd be 499 empty seats, one student with a tape recorder. <laughs> well, it happened to some of my other colleagues, so I was on notice, so I decided I wouldn't use notes. I would just learn how to reach out to the audience and talk to them like you did. I can see you're an accomplished speaker. And that has some bearing because years later, when I was in the Oval Office with the President, about to be introduced to the American people as President Bush's nominee to be the 73rd Secretary of the Treasury, he looked at me and said, John, the staff here in the White House is delighted that you're coming on board. And I said, well, thanks, Mr. President. I'm really honored and delighted to do it. He said, well, I'm really serious. He said, there, you're a good communicator. <clears throat> he said, that's so important. And we need that. And uh, he said, they tell me you often give speeches extemporaneously. Yes, President Bush used that complicated word. <laughs> <laughs> notes. Don't use notes. And I said, well, coming back to the University of Maryland, I told him the story. And he said, boy, that is really, really something. I admire that. He said, that's a great, great gift. <clears throat> he said, in this job, and he looked at me very sternly, I said, use notes. <laughs> <laughs> I thought if I ever wrote a, you know, an autobiography, <laughs> And, and for the Treasury Secretary, that was awfully good advice because you're dealing with these global markets, these massive global markets, 
you're dealing with issues like the ones we'll come to in a, in a moment, the debt ceiling and the budget crisis and the shutdown, and you deal with those issues, and one of the most sensitive is the, is the question of foreign exchange. There's something like $5 trillion a day traded in the foreign exchange market. And if the Treasury Secretary, who's the only person allowed in the United States government to talk about uh, the, the dollar, ever slips and says the wrong thing on the dollar, the, the markets go into uh, perturbation, wide swings. And the, the analysts love it, the traders love it, because they make money on these wide swings. So they're always trying to get the financial press to ask the Treasury Secretary a question such as, Mr. Secretary, how is the dollar doing? <laughs> and of course, you learn how to dodge that question. <laughs> it's the first week in office you say to yourself, I'm going to learn the, the lexicon of this. I'm going to learn how to parry this question. And you come up sounding pretty idiotic sometimes, I must say, because you say, you know my policy. I'm for a strong dollar. <laughs> <laughs> press you further, and you say, there's no change in my policy. It's a strong dollar. It was a strong dollar the day I came in. It's a strong dollar today. Well, is the dollar strong? You know my policy. <laughs> <laughs> so yes, you get back and forth with, with all that. But Treasury secretaries learn to avoid that engagement. They don't want to engage on that question. Um, Typified by the story of a very able Treasury Secretary uh, some years back who was invited to address a group, a small group, private group, after dinner. And he rose and accepted the chairman's request to speak, but uh, the, uh, the end of his presentation, a question came. Somebody raised their hand and said uh, that the chairman could, would the, would the Treasury Secretary take some questions? And uh, the first question had to do with, how's your dollar policy doing? <laughs> Just as you would expect. And the Treasury Secretary looked at the chairman sternly. And he said, Mr. Chairman, is this, uh, is this, are there any members of the media at this dinner here tonight? And he was assured there were none. Then he said, are there, am I assured by you that this, this conversation is privileged? And it's a private, confidential conversation. And he was assured it was. And then he said to the chairman, Mr. Chairman, can you give me your word that this dinner is off the record? And he was assured it was off the record. The Treasury Secretary then went over to the person who had asked the question, who was sitting right where you are, and he said, no comment. <laughs> So it really is fun for me to be, be, be back here. I feel at home, not only because it's, uh, it, it's a classroom university setting, but because of so many family and friends that, uh, that are in this, this, this audience. And of course, the, the opportunity to honor somebody that I uh, knew well and uh, respected deeply, Burton, Burton K. Wheeler. Uh, and Bradley, I'm proud of you in this important role as the, uh, the chairman of the, 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 the Wheeler Center, uh, carrying on the legacy of uh, that, that needs to be understood. I think Senator Wheeler would be appalled at what's going on in Washington today. The failure of political leaders to grab the bit and act. The failure of political leaders to think beyond their own short-term political interests and put the country's agenda at the top of what they focused on. But it's also fun to be with so many wheelers. <laughs> Kendall, and Robbins, and Hillary, and, uh, and uh, friends like Corky and Vanessa here that we've gotten to know through Bradley over, over the years. And I don't know how you timed this so well, Bradley, but to have the government shutdown and the impending default on the national debt uh, be at the center of the national agenda uh, at the very time I'm supposed to be here and talk about it. Uh, pretty hard work, hard work to get that done. Now, 
is, is, as you pointed out, Bob, I've been in the, the Ford administration. And, uh, you know, politics is never a beanball. It's always, always some strife and conflict to it. But uh, I'll tell you, it's nothing like what, what I found when I went back to Washington. One of the jobs of the Treasury Secretary is to be on the front line for the issues like the debt ceiling, issues like uh, the, the, uh, the annual funding of the budget. And one of the jobs the Treasury Secretary has is presenting the president's budget, the administration's budget, to the Congress before the, the various congressional committees that have responsibilities, budget committees, the Ways and Means Committee, and the Senate Finance Committee, where Amon Tannen sits as the current chairman. And <clears throat> it fell to me to do that. But it fell to me to do that after I'd been in office a total of about four days. So I took the weekend and studied the budget documents for fiscal year 2004, because it's always the next year that you're defending the budget on. This was February of 03. And I worked hard and tried to master it and, and make the best case I could for, for the positions in the budget, tried to anticipate all the questions that would come, uh, practice some good Q&A that you always do getting ready for these, these sessions with, uh, with the congressional committee, recognizing there'd be some adverse question. Not everybody loved the Bush administration budget. <laughs> uh, when you're in Washington and you're a Republican, <clears throat> it means about half the people are going to try and find a way to trip you up. Uh, half the people in Washington get up every morning trying to trip up the other half, basically, how the place works. So I appear before the House Ways and Means Committee. Now, I've been in office three days. Make the case for the for the fiscal 04 budget, and uh, got my introduction in the second question. The second questioner uh, gave me this new introduction, their introduction to the new Washington. He looked at me sternly, uh, and you're always sitting down, and they're always sitting up, so they have a certain advantage over you. Well, remember those days in the legislature where the witnesses were always down there? Oh, I should have said that we have in the audience a member of the Montana legislature, a member of the Montana House, who's not who represents the 63rd district and who isn't only uh, not not only involved in public service, but I hope she's going to become a member of the Snow family. And I'm speaking, of course, about. Uh, Bradley's betrothed, uh, the Honorable Riley Neal. Riley, you better raise your hand so people know who I'm talking about. So the second or third questioner looks at me and he says, Mr. Secretary, you are presiding over a disaster. A disaster. He said, when you took office, we had a surplus. Now we have a deficit. <laughs> uh, he said, under your tenure, we created 6 million unemployed Americans. Poverty levels are rising. The deficit is, is going to be in red ink as far as the, the eye can see. He said, this is a disaster. This is a disaster. You ought to be impeached. And I'm thinking, three days on the job? <laughs> Give me a chance here. You know, maybe come back in two weeks and impeach me. But so I, I could have gone down Bradley on record as the shortest tenured secretary, <laughs> secretary of the Treasury. Uh, let's take take a few minutes and talk about what's going on in Washington today. Uh, I know that's on everybody's mind, and maybe offer a perspective on it that goes beyond the beyond the headlines, and uh, puts it in, the, in, in, in context, in some context. Uh, I mean, these are all intelligent people. Uh, they're people who, by and large, do care about the country. Uh, and and they're, they're, they're people who've been through elections. They represent somebody. And that's awfully important. Because we are a divided country. 
the the house of representatives is almost evenly divided between democrats and republicans republicans have a small plurality the senate is almost evenly divided the democrats have a small plurality one thing i learned for sure about washington is the members of congress know their districts they know their voters they know what's on their voters minds and they are responsive to their voters the rare congressman who says i'm going to defy my voters and go there and just do what i think is right regardless of my voters you know why there aren't very many of them because they'd never come back they wouldn't last they wouldn't be there so i start with this proposition we're dividing from when you when you do these polls <clears throat> the gallup polls or the other polls the focus groups what do you find the country as a whole is about one-third republican one-third democrat and one-third independent and we're having an enormous debate about the future of the country do we want more government do we want government playing a larger role do we want a larger welfare state or do we want to shrink the welfare state do we want less government do we want uh, smaller uh, smaller government less intrusion by government in our life that's the fundamental dividing line um, and then you come to an issue that we're facing today which is playing out that that fundamental dichotomy in american political life and i know the far right gets criticized and the far left gets criticized and i, I don't have a, a, a brief for either one of them frankly. but they are representing some voters and they know if they go back to their districts and vote against the interests of those voters they're going to be in trouble so the situation we're observing and living with is in a way a natural product of the democratic processes with one philip that i think we have to add uh, that's gerrymandering over the course of the last 25 years or so uh, congressional districts and both parties have done this when they controlled the state legislatures have decided we're going to create a lot of safe districts and it's been republicans and, and it's democrats uh, and so there are an awful lot of safe districts today and the safe districts are really a lot different than the competitive districts and the people who come out of the safe districts are a lot different than the people who come out of the competitive districts when I was in the Treasury, I <clears throat> traveled around a lot across the country. I uh, did a lot of speeches on the state of the economy and so on. And what I found was, because you always meet the congressman, the congressman up from the district always wants to come and, and, and be seen with you, because then they get on television. That's another thing congressmen like. They like being in the in, in media. Uh, so you'd meet them. And the striking thing was the difference in the makeup, the temperament, the capacity of the members from the competitive districts versus the members from the safe districts. If you're from a safe district, you don't have to think much about the other side. You know, there isn't any other side that counts. If you're from a competitive district, you're trying to understand where everybody is coming from and then producing a result that brings people together. Uh, those are the sort of so, sort of politicians that DK Wheeler. Well, there are three kinds of politicians, basically. There's the, the workhorse, that was BK. There's the show horse. And then there's the furniture. The, the furniture are most of them who get moved around by the show horses and the workhorses. Uh, but the, 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 the ish, remember Shakespeare's line about the fault lines, not in the stars, but with us? Uh, how do people get elected in the United States? <laughs> well, they, they promise the voters what the voters want, don't they? You know, 
more of this and more of that, more of what's good for you. Our district will do this. We fine, you elect me. I'm gonna make sure we have A, B, C, and D for our for you, my voters, my constituents. You're entitled to that. I'm gonna to go to Washington and get it for you. But they never say what it's gonna cost. <laughs> so our, our electoral process is based on telling the voters what, what they want to hear about the benefits that are gonna come their way if you vote for me. I never tell them what it's going to cost. We're only dealing with the cost in, in a deferred way. Then you ask yourself, why do we have a big deficit? <laughs> Isn't that electoral equation I just laid out for you, isn't that a master plan for large deficits? If our elected officials get elected by telling us they're going to get us something and never tell us it's going to cost anything, they're going to get elected, they're going to go to Washington, they're going to try and produce that benefit. And they have. And the costs are deferred, but the costs are coming due. The costs are really coming due. And the issue that we're, they're dealing with in Washington today is not the real issue. It's, it's a sideshow on the real issue. What they're talking about in Washington today is the, the current budget. Um, but the current budget is, is, is secondary. What we got to worry about is the long-term fiscal hole we built for the country. We're running deficits now. They've come down because of the sequester and some tax increases. The sequester was the trap that the Congress gave itself, hoisted by their own petard, and then they found that, 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 that they they put this thing out there so they wouldn't have to do it, and then, then they had to do it because they couldn't get out of it, out of its way. So now the deficit's coming down. The short-term deficit is about well, 4 or 5% uh, headed towards that over the course of the next, next few years. Not too bad by historic standards. Um, still large in absolute terms, bigger than it should be, but <clears throat> all the commentators say, look at the deficit coming down. It's not really that big a deal, is it? Well, it's not in the short term. But go out 10 years and look at the CBO estimates. The Congressional Budget Office, not Democrats, not Republicans. They're the professional budgeteers of our government. And what do they tell us? They tell us in 20 years, which isn't that far away, Medicare, and Medicaid, and Social Security <clears throat> will absorb all, all of the revenues of the United States if we keep revenues at the 20% of GDP level that they've been historically. And that's, that's pretty astonishing, isn't it? Uh, what that means is that our government will really be funding Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, and won't have the revenues to fund Justice Department, the Defense Department, the Agricultural Department, uh, NIH, and all these services. Now, well, how could that be? How could that possibly be? And how could it be ignored? Well, somebody once said that, that demography is destiny and, and demography is driving the future fiscal affairs of this country. We're an aging society. We don't like to be. Bill, you and I don't want to admit that, do we? <laughs> But it's not just you and me, it's, it's, it's the country as a whole. Uh, and what happens with an aging society? Well, there are fewer workers. People are retired. Retired workers draw their social security. They live longer. Great thing, wonderful thing. But they draw their social security long, longer. When B.K. Wheeler was in the Senate, 1935, Great idea came along, drawn from Bismarck, let's protect people in their old age. Because people tend to, to over-consume in life and not, during their young years, you know, their working years, and not save for the future. A perfectly reasonable proposition. Uh, and so we established Social Security. When Social Security was established in 1935, life expectancy for a male was 65. Uh, the, uh, 
the uh, uh, workforce had something like 40 people paying in to Social Security. 40 people paying in for every one retiree. Over time, that number has just continuously come down. If you have 40 people paying in for every retiree, you'll have a healthy system. It'll work. But today, it's three. And in 10 years, it's going to be two. Now, you can't have a fiscally sound Social Security system if two people, uh, you know, if there are only two people working to carry all these retirees. Now, this isn't a matter of ideology. This is not, this is not liberal, conservative, libertarian, or anything else. This is arithmetic. And you would think that you, you could deal with arithmetic and get sensible, sensible results. Remember, Senator Moynihan, somebody I, I admire, Democrat from New York, who was asked to chair the Social Security uh, Commission back in 1983. Greenspan was on and others of prominence. He, uh, he opened the meeting by saying, uh, delighted to have you all participate in this. Look forward to, to our, our, our work. He said, you're all going to be entitled to your own views, but you won't be entitled to your own facts. You know, the fact is, Social Security is not sustainable. But it's really easily fixable. The, the, the discrepancy between the revenues coming into Social Security and the expenditures going out is pretty narrow. We could have fixed it. And we tried to, actually, in 2005 and didn't, didn't get very far. Uh, that was pure politics. Because uh, the other side had decided that uh, this is a wonderful opportunity for us because they're trying to take away your Social Security. And they, 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 uh, the other side would never engage. Uh, so we didn't get had one member from the other other party in the House, not one member from the Senate, who would ever even engage on on, on, on the issue. It, I learned a, a big a big lesson that you know uh, uh, you got to on big big issues like. Like Social Security, you need bipartisan support. If you don't have it, you're going to lose. And uh, the Democrats actually had a big victory out of opposing Social Security. They took back the House in 06. And part of their argument was, we saved your Social Security. Well, Social Security is fixable. We ought to get on with it. Bill Clinton wanted to do it in 96. In 96, I used to cite him all the time. He said, uh, Social Security is on the verge of bankruptcy, 96. So I'm, 10 years later, I'm going around the country citing Bill Clinton, Republican citing the Democratic president. And I would simply say, look, if it was on the verge of it 10 years ago, aren't we even that much closer now? Shouldn't we get around to deal with this? This is all about, about, about arithmetic. The arithmetic there is, 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 is really very simple. Everybody knows this who studies these issues. If you added something like six months to the retirement age for every decade going out, it's done. It's fixed. Not a big deal. Medicare is the gigantic deal. Medicare is my title. Because Medicare is this promise we've made to the citizens. Social Security is the promise for compensation in your retirement. Uh, Medicare is this sort of open-ended promise to health care. And what's happened to health care over the last 30 years? It's been going up at a compounded rate way beyond, way beyond GDP. And you don't have to be Einstein to realize if something goes up faster than GDP, long enough, what happens? It becomes GDP. <laughs> and when, when Medicare restarted, uh, it was a small fraction of, it was a small fraction 
of GDP. It's become a mighty big fraction. And uh, as I say, in, in 20 years, Medicare with, with Social Security will absorb all of the revenues at the level that we have traditionally had tax policy in the United States. Now, how do you fix that? Well, that I, I won't try to get into that tonight. That's, that, that's hours and hours and hours of digging into a lot of complex facts. But, but Medicare is going up because we're an aging population, and as you get older, you use more health care. And also, health care keeps rising, the cost of health care keeps rising. Again, way above GDP. So this combination of lots of new demand for the services driving up the cost of services, and the services keep going up. And uh, the current unfunded liability, this will give you a staggering number. If you looked at Medicare and you said uh, over a, a longer time horizon, 50 year time horizon, and you said how far on an actuarial basis, the way an accountant or an actuary would look at it, how far out of killer is this system? Well, it's out of meaning the, the inflows and outflows, present value of the difference between inflows and outflows, the way an accountant would look at this, or an actuary would look at it, is something like $70 trillion. Now, the GDP in the United States is 16. This is $70 trillion. It's huge multiple of of the GDP of the country. How do we pay for things? We pay for things out of the GDP. So how, how do we fix these problems? Well, you say, let's, let's cut discretionary programs. You know, don't we have a remember when Ronald Reagan talked about waste, fraud, and abuse? Let's just clean out all the waste, fraud, and abuse. That's how we fix it. Well, waste, fraud, and abuse doesn't even uh, isn't even a decimal point on Medicare. Uh, oh, so, so, so that doesn't do it. Well, what about these discretionary programs? All these foreign offices we have, all these embassies, uh, all these frivolous things, foreign aid. Let's cut that out. That isn't really good either. That's just, that's just peanuts against the increases in Medicare. Uh, well, what about the, the other programs? Well, okay, tell me, you want to not have a treasury department? You want to not have a defense department? <laughs> you not, want to have, not have an agriculture department? And even if you take all of them away, you still can't solve the problem. Ah, uh, let's raise taxes. Well, that's, that's an approach. We could raise taxes. You know how much you'd have to raise taxes to pay for this explosion of Medicare, Medicaid, Social Security? Well, you'd have to more than double. So we go from 20% of revenue being absorbed by the tax system coming into the to 40%. So okay, you're you're paying taxes at the rate of 25%. Now you pay 50. Well, you say that what's so bad with that? Well, what do you think happens to an economy where tax rates are roughly doubled? It's not going to perform like the one we have today. You know, one of the, one of the strongest teachings of economics is the simple lesson that you always get less of anything you tax. So if you put a lot of taxes on people, you're gonna, it's gonna affect the way they behave. You're gonna have less risk taking, you're gonna have less entrepreneurship, you're gonna have less effort and energy put in, into the workforce. So we can't solve this by taxes. We wreck the economy. We can't solve it by cutting out waste, fraud, and abuse. It's just too small. We can't solve it by, by, by eliminating the discretionary programs because these mandatory programs are already two-thirds of the budget. They're just not big enough. Well, you're going to have to slow the growth of these programs. It looks like the same. And you're going to have to find a way to grow the economy so that the economy is robust enough to be able to help fund these uh, this this explosion, and you got to find a way to bring in healthcare costs, and you know, that's part of the debate in Washington. Now, how do you rein in healthcare costs? Um, John Bro, senator from from uh, wonderful guy, senator from New Orleans, really 
centrist politician. Never could have been beaten in, in, uh, in, in Louisiana. Told me once at having dinner with him, he goes, I'm just back from a town hall meeting. And he was telling me about his town hall meeting. And he told me about the lady who said to him, Senator, by gosh, whatever you do in Washington, this is the time they were looking at uh, some, some, some of the strain on the budgets, I mean, back in the, the days of the English Clinton budget settlement. Whatever you do on the, on, on the budget, and I applaud you, you try to reduce the size of government, don't let those people in Washington get their hands on my Medicare. Well, of course, Medicare is entirely a government program. So the, the lady liked her Medicare and wanted to make sure it was preserved. And the truth is, people like Medicare. They like Social Security. They want them preserved. But if we preserve them in the form they are today, we're going to bankrupt the country. So I'll close on a hopeful note comes from a great statesman with an American mother, uh, Winston, Winston Churchill, who said about America, this is the optimistic note, said about America, we Americans always get it right. Always get it right. After they have exhausted every other possibility. <laughs> so it seems to me we're well on the way to exhausting every Every other, every other possibility. This, this, this will get fixed. I'm confident of that. I mean, this, this whole situation, because it has to. And what's going to fix it in the end is uh, is the financial market, because the amount of debt that the United States will have to continue to issue to fund the annual shortfalls in ten years out is so large that interest rates on Treasuries will skyrocket. And Treasuries will face what's known as a failed auction. They'll put their the bonds out there, the Treasury bonds, which is the biggest bond market in the world, put them out there, and, and the Chinese and the Japanese and the Germans and the British won't show up unless interest rates are an awful lot higher. And if interest rates get to the level that they would have to get to and enable us to sell our bonds, uh, we're going to have interest at 10, 12 percent of the GDP. I've already told you that the that, that, that Medicare and Medicaid folks are taking it to 20 percent of GDP. You add another 10 percent for, for the interest rate. It's just not sustainable. So that's my my optimistic close. Borrows from a from a economist friend of mine uh, from my days teaching at the University of, uh, of, of Virginia. A guy named Herb Stein, who had a, was a witty economist, if that's not an oxymoron. <laughs> and what Herb Stein said is, if, if something isn't sustainable, this is wisdom here, if something isn't sustainable, it probably won't happen. <laughs> right? <laughs> so this enormous growth in these programs <clears throat> that would bankrupt the country uh, aren't sustainable. And since they aren't sustainable, financial markets and the political processes will come along to, to end it. But the final note to leave you on, Bob, a philosophical note, and that is, are, are we at a state in our, that our founding fathers could never have contemplated, where we can't solve, or the DK Wheeler never could have contemplated, that we can't solve our problems short of a crisis? That we have to get into a crisis to solve our problems. We'll solve these problems in a crisis. America is resilient and our political system works and when we get a crisis, we'll come together and solve it. But do we have to have a crisis to solve it? Final question. All right, look forward to your questions. Thank you, Bob.
<laughs> Thank you very much for coming and talking tonight. If Thank you very much for coming and talking tonight. If the current course of fiscal responsibility continues, how many years are we from bankruptcy? Oh, I, I think uh, ten, 10 years out if, 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 if actions in the interim haven't been taken, uh, we're going to be in. Financial markets don't tolerate it. Won't tolerate it. We've already had two. S&P has twice now said it downgraded the United States from uh, uh, debt. We'll get downgraded further. Uh, and uh, we'll find ourselves unable to sell the, the treasuries. The way the government works, of course, is we, we don't have enough money to pay our bills, so we borrow. And that's what the, the issues of new treasuries are to pay for current uh, expenditures of the federal government. And you can go on for a while, because America's a big, strong, rich country, but even the strongest and richest country in the world can, can go beyond it, its own ability to pay the bills. And when you get there, who's going to lend to you? That's the, that's the discipline that will eventually come, come to play here. Uh, government is not like a household. A typical household, you don't, you know, you, you, can, you got revenue coming in, you got expenditures. If those expenditures exceed your income, uh, at some point, you can go to your uh, relatives, you got friendly relatives, uh, you can go to the banks for a while, but at some point, you're going to get closed down. <laughs> And you're going to have to change your lifestyle. Now, governments can go on a long time, uh, but they can't go on forever because those the borrowers are out there. Governments are now becoming dependent on on the financial markets. And I'd say within the next ten years or so, uh, the dangerous thing about this good period we're in now is that it is. Um, it's taken away the urgency. It's taken away the urgency because the deficit's coming down and people say, isn't this nice? Isn't this a, a happy state of affairs? Aren't we fortunate? Look, we have a deficit that's, that's lower than the historic average of the deficit is a fraction of GDP. Yeah, it is, and it will be. CPO's got this laid out, but then boom, then it really skyrockets. When it skyrockets, we're going to have to issue, you know, huge amounts of treasury debt, and that's when the market is going to say, "Nope, you know, you're we're not going to give you that debt." The Chinese are going to say, "We're not going to continue funding you." The Japanese will say that and they fund half of our new treasury issues. So I think it's not that far off. But <clears throat> Bob, you should comment on this. You've been in political life. Maybe we should get you commenting on this, Riley. Business people like myself are often criticized for being short sighted. But business people make investments for the future and they, they have to uh, look at what the return on that investment will be. And they use something called discounting. You discount that. When we get our money back over the 20 year life of this investment. Uh, and they apply a, a, a reasonable discount rate to the future. My experience in the political sphere, and this is not a comment uh, on, on either party, is that politicians tend to use very high discount rates. That the, the future is, is never here. What's here is my next election. <laughs> What's always confronting me is that election, which you're a house member on average of the year away. So you discount four years out. <coughs> you discount six years out. That's not relevant. So somehow we gotta get politicians thinking, applying a different discount rate. And then I'm back to what I said earlier. Maybe the fault lies not with the stars, but with us, because we're discounting the future too much as well when we ask the Congress and our elected officials to give us all these benefits and never asking them, well, that's wonderful to have this new this or that in my district. What's it going to cost, Congressman? And how am I going to end up paying for it? That's not a discussion that happens in many open town hall meetings. Other? Yeah. Uh, okay, one second. Thank you. Mr. Secretary, we have a talent for making things understandable and 
very complicated, and I appreciate that. <laughs> um, let me throw a different set of proposals at you and see what your thoughts are. Um, one is defense spending has doubled in the last 11 years, so let's cut that back in half. The NSA alone and intelligence ex expenditures are about $75 billion. Take Social Security off budget again. It was self-funding till 2010. And let's put some constraints on healthcare costs, just for starters. We have to make adjustments for the demographics, I understand that. Raising the ceiling on income that's earned and taxable under Social Security would change that dramatically, just a small percentage. So what are your thoughts on some of those ideas? Uh, they're good ideas, and they've got, they've got to be explored. But the one that, that really is powerful <clears throat> is, um, is slowing the, the rate of growth of healthcare costs. I mean, that, that's really the game. There was a brilliant character in the Treasury Department when I was there, who was undersecretary of uh, uh, domestic markets, the, responsible for the U.S. bond issues. And he said, said one day to me, it struck home, he said the United, because we have all these United States government you know, guarantees Social Security, guarantees Medicare, guarantees Medicare, all these, which means it's an insurance program. You know, where the United States government is in the business of guaranteeing these promises that we've made in the political process. <coughs> this is a I'm comment on your military. He said, you know, if you were to look at the United States government as an analyst would, what would you conclude? You would conclude we are a gigantic insurance company with a small defense subsidiary. Defense is big in absolute, in absolute numbers, but in relative terms, it's, it's reasonably small. As he said, it, it would be, if you looked at the United States government as a, as a business analyst, you would have said, what's it all about? It's an insurance company with a small defense subsidiary. It'd be nice to, to find another $100 billion, you know, but Ever my number? 70 trillion? That's the, and, and if you watch the, the dialogue in, in Washington today, who's talking about the 70 trillion? Who's talking about the unfunded, the, the unfunded commitments of the future, the promises to the future that we can't afford? So I'd be all with you, that, that helps in the short term. But unless we get at these long-term problems, we're gonna face the issue I, went over with you of not being able to fund our, our government of defaults of, on the U.S. Treasury issues. They won't be, they, they won't, nobody will buy them. Or if they buy them, they'll buy them at interest rates like we used to have of 15, 20%. And then you really are in the soup. You really are in the soup. So I, I would applaud you know, just taking a look at those ideas of yours. They're good ideas. And they'll help us in the interim. But, we're not too far away from that time when the cataclysm hits, hits us. And I, I wish we, we get on with, with the, the actions to, to deal with the really big issues, Medicare, Medicaid, Social Security, veterans benefits are in there as a part of that. Because these things keep just growing and growing and growing. And the gap between income, revenue coming in, and, uh, and expenditures keeps, keeps, keeps rising. So good, good ideas help in the short term but aren't enough to deal with the long-term problems of Social Security. That's, that's the aging issue. That's just have people retire a little bit later or, or means test some of, the, some of the payments and so on. Uh, healthcare costs. How do you get healthcare costs down? I mean, that is the big, big issue. Um, I think we made a big mistake back in back in BK's day, Roosevelt's day, of putting uh, wage controls during the war on uh, unemployment. The National Wage Control Plan was put into effect. And the employers competing for the workers obliged the federal requirement, but they skirted around it by beginning to provide benefits on the side. One of those benefits was health care. Little did they realize the consequences of, third, of, of, of making third parties responsible for your health care. Because it disconnected the, the consumer and the cost 
from the provider. And uh, what I'd like to see us do is break that connection so that we aren't so dependent on third-party payers. Now that's big because that's the way the system is organized. But <clears throat> there are ways to end that connection. But just, just ask your, yourself, how does healthcare get provided in America? For most of it, somebody else pays for it. How often have you gone to a, your, your provider, your healthcare provider, and said, Doctor, um, do I really need this? Is there a, is there a, a less expensive way to, to, to deal with this problem? Uh, I'd like to shop around. Uh, can you recommend some other doctors that I ought to talk to who might be able to give me a more cost-effective solution to this? I remember one day I was <clears throat> doing one of these talk shows, and uh, some prominent uh, member of the Fourth Estate was, was doing the questioning, and I was making this sort of argument. I said, you know, you don't. Uh, Americans are great consumers, but. Uh, we aren't very good consumers of, of healthcare, the way healthcare is organized. Uh, and when when you, uh, you know, when you when you buy an automobile, you get it, you get wreck insurance, you get you get casualty insurance. So if you have a big accident, you know you're you're covered. But do you get insurance for your windshield wipers? I mean, do you get coverage for everything? No, you don't. But the way healthcare has been provided, it's it's soup to nuts. It's everything. So what I think we ought to be going to is a system where people have healthcare coverage for catastrophic type things, uh, low low, uh, you know this this case where they uh, the high deductible, uh, and you pay more of your own healthcare costs. And you then take a deeper interest in the quality of the health care you're getting and the cost of it. Um, very few people ever see the real cost of the health care they're getting. I had a great friend who, who uh, went and got a hip operation. And he told me that he was covered under Medicare at $17,000. And I happened about the same time to be talking to Newt Gingrich. And, uh, Gingrich then was in full flower. Uh, he, you know, was on the he was on Time magazine as the prime minister. And I, I I knew him quite quite well, and he really loved the healthcare issues. And, and uh, he was telling me about his agenda for America and how he was going to delegate this to this member of Congress and this to this member of Congress, but he was going to keep healthcare. And that he had the answer on healthcare. And I said, No, really, you got the answer on healthcare. Uh, what is it? He said, it's the private sector. I said, well, I'm, I'm for the private sector. How are you going to do it? He said, I'm going to unleash the creativity of the private sector. That'll solve it. The innovative uh, efforts of the private sector will bring down costs and improve service. And I said, well, that, yeah, I, I, that, I think it probably would. But let me tell you about my friend who just had this hip operation. And Medicare paid for it, and they paid for $17,000. Do you think that the private sector is so efficient that they can get the cost of his hip operation down to zero? He said, what do you mean? And I said, if, if the government is making health care available, subsidizing health care to the extent they are, the private sector can't compete against government subsidies. Um, I mean, this is this is the tough one, and, and another piece of this one Ed, is, is that is that one of the reasons healthcare costs are rising so much is technology, and we we're, we are we are producing the best healthcare technologies in the world in the United States, but they're bloody costly. They are really costly, and every hospital worth its name wants them. So the costs of providing healthcare are are going up, and up and up and up. And putting some break on all of this, I, mean, I wish I wish I thought Obamacare would do it, but I, I'm not all that optimistic that it will. But some some break on the, the continuing escalation of healthcare costs seems to me has to be has to be part of our national agenda for the next for the next 20 years.
but I like your idea. Yes, sir. <laughs> I just have one question again. Thank you for coming this evening. I appreciate your effort to be here. But my question is this do you think, this is a general question, but do you think in like the current debt negotiation that the, uh, the concerns about the health care, Obamacare, have any business in those negotiations? Uh, well, they're, they're coming up right now, of course, in the in the, um, in the in the government shutdown. It's, that's what that's all about. The Republicans are saying we'd like to we don't like Obamacare, and we we we're going to use the the budget as a vehicle to one way or another. I mean, what they'd like to do is defund it. They, they they've lost that many many times. So they're saying postpone it for a year, uh, and. Uh, they're not getting very far with that. And they might be right in principle. I could see where in principle you could agree with them. But I think tactically, and I've had this discussion with some of the some of the Republican leaders, tactically it's a mistake because they're going to lose. And the American public doesn't like the idea of uh, putting the the government's operations at, at risk on this issue. I think their view is fight that out. If it's as bad as you say it is, let it come into being and it will collapse with its own weight. Uh, so I think it's a bad tactic. On the other hand, I talked about these unfunded mandates that are bankrupting the country. This is an unfunded mandate. This is a huge unfunded mandate. So you can see why uh, the, these Republicans are saying <clears throat> we shouldn't have another unfunded mandate. At least we're addressing the big issues of the of the of the budget. But in my view, they're addressing them the the, the wrong the wrong way. Uh, I was asked today to, to to do some of these talk shows over the weekend, and believe me, somebody's going to say to me, "Your question: Do you agree with the Tea Party's view on health care?" Uh, and Ms. Secretary, what would you do if, if you were back in the, in the Treasury? And uh, so on and so forth. And uh, what's, what's going to happen with the uh, debt ceiling? Will that get resolved? And uh, if you were back there, what would you be telling the President? So this is a good warm up. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> Debts. 
pay our obligations. And uh, therefore, the debt ceiling just has to be raised, or we forfeit the greatest advantage America has, which is the full faith and credit that our debt is given in global markets. We are the gold standard for debt markets. And if we ever forfeited that, uh, Treasuries would lose their pristine position in the world. Uh, our, our role as the financial powerhouse of the world would be called into question. Our ability to provide global leadership would be called into question. Uh, a default's unthinkable. And whereas with the shutdown, I think the Democrats are getting a victory because the Republicans are being predominantly blamed with a default where America can't pay its interest on its debts. Uh, I think the president will get, will, will get the blame. Because after all, it's the president and the treasury that are responsible for the fiscal uh, affairs of the United States. The blame will come back to the president on, on that. I'm sure the White House advisors will be going to the president some point here soon, and it's not very far, I think it's October the 17th, saying to Mr. President, you know, we better find a way to solve this, or it's going to be the arch our baby. And if we go beyond the 17th, if we go, go much beyond the 17th, I mean, there's going to be chaos in the new world markets. Yeah, you think he does. Yeah, he, can't, he can't raise it on his... I mean, there's some artificial things you can do, but you can't raise it. I've been there and tried to think about what you can do when you're in this situation. At some point, you run out of options, and they're, they're at the point. Secretary Blue announced that he's out of options beyond the 17th of, of, of October. Hi. During your term as U.S. Secretary of the Treasury, what would you say is your biggest contribution? And also, secondly, what was the best part of your job? <laughs> Good, 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 good questions. Uh, well, I think probably the, 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 the things that, that, that I'm most pleased with, I, I was proud to be part of, pleased to be part of that effort to lower marginal tax rates on capital. I've always believed that, uh, that uh, lower, lower tax rates, this was, when I came in, the, the tax rates on dividends were uh, at the highest level were 36.9%. And the capital gains rates Gains on stock was at, I think it was 25 percent. We were able to bring the dividend rates down uh, and uh, to 15 percent, and the capital gains rates down to 15 percent. Uh, that was helpful at a time when the economy was uh, was was weak, and uh, uh, I'd like to find a way that we could make permanent low taxes on capital. Now, why is that? Well, you create your future. You create your economic future by current investments. And people will invest more uh, if they have lower tax rates. For the simple reason that returns on the capital, on capital invested are higher with low tax rates. So low tax rates are a way to encourage capital formation. And capital formation is the seed corn of the future output. And as you have more capital, labor productivity goes up. And as labor productivity goes up, there's the potential for higher per capita income, higher wages, which is what we all want to see, want to see happen. So I, I'm pleased with that. Uh, I, I was pleased to, uh, to uh, continue to push for more open trade agreements, and we, we accomplished some. Uh, I was... Uh, Pleased to establish the first finance department in the world that had a, uh, an intelligence capacity to deal with terrorism, terrorist finance. Uh, we, we rightly recognized that if you're going to deal with the terrorists, one way to do it is to follow the money. Because they, they, they need the money, they need the blood money in order to function. And we, do, we, we put in place. Uh, with the authorization of Congress, went up and persuaded them that the Treasury Department needed its own intelligence capacity 
and regulatory authority over the banks to uh, that, that know their customers and, and, and uh, report in on suspicious act activity. Think can't talk about it because it's all classified, but, but many lives were saved because of it. Because when you watch the money, you can go find the terrorists. And when you watch the money, you can go to the terrorist funding bases and take action against, against them. So that was important. The other one out was, was fun. My first meeting of the G7, G7 is the, the seven big countries of the world, um, went to it as a rookie finance minister and was sort of taken aback by these, these discussions. We were talking about uh, global trade, we were talking about global imbalances, we were talking about global capital formations. <clears throat> and I left the meeting, it was, something was a jar, I couldn't quite figure out what it was, and then it dawned on me. We didn't have the right people in the meeting. Because if you want to talk about global trade, you better get China and Brazil and, and India in the room. Um, and if you want to talk about global imbalances, you've got to have China in there. They had this huge Capital, I mean, the current account uh, surplus, which was the other side of our huge current account deficit. So I came back, talked to the staff at the Treasury, and it turned out that the next meeting of the G7, America was the chairman. So I was the chairman of the meeting. And uh, I sent out an invitation to the Chinese, the Russian, the Indian, the Brazilian, and the South African finance ministers to attend the meeting never happened before, and now it's become a permanent part of, uh, of the meetings of the, the, G, the G7. So that's, that's something that I think is, is uh, uh, I'm, real, I'm real pleased with. Disappointments, I wish we'd done better on the deficits. we got time for two more. Way back in the back. I think we'll be done with that one. Uh, <clears throat> I have a question. Thank you for showing up here and speaking to us. Uh, first of all, uh, in the term that you served as Treasury Secretary, it's a four-part question. How many times did you raise the, uh, the ceiling? Uh, first question. Second part is, do you, did you agree with your predecessor's uh, policies with regards to TARP? Uh, third being, do you agree with the um, the Fed chairman now policies and possibly the predecessor's policies, which seems to be about the same? And whether or not that's a great, that's a great question. <laughs> I think the answer is I'm not sure. <laughs> and then, but it's my answer. I, I got you. I got okay, you. And so then whether or not, and I know that you're talking about the financial markets coming in right. and you know possibly you know dealing with some stuff like that. If right now what is reflected in Walmart, is, or excuse me, in on Wall Street is not a fundamental trading, because right now I mean, in all intents and purposes, we get GDP of like what, one or two percent. Why is the stock market still going up? And so you're, you know, saying that the, you know, world financial markets are coming in and are buying our, our bonds based on those fundamentals, but our stock market right now isn't responding to fundamentals. So that's my question. Okay, well, uh, on, on Bernanke and uh, QE, you're asking really about QE, QE2. Uh, QE2 was an effort to use monetary policy to get more growth in the American economy. Okay. Uh, and uh, uh, he, the idea was that, that uh, lower, lower interest, if you give lower interest rates to treasury holders, they'll They'll sell out, and then they'll go in and, and buy something else. So you'll they'll move capital around, create more liquidity in the system. It hasn't worked out just the way Ben Bernanke and the Fed wanted, because while we've seen uh, asset values go up, as you say, the real economy hasn't responded nearly as well. And we still have unacceptably high unemployment rates, we still have stagnant wages, um, we still have a middle class problem of a, of, a, of a middle class that seems to be shrinking, and we don't have very strong GDP growth. 
On the other hand, where would we have been if we didn't do QE2, QE3? And the dilemma that, that um, Ben Bernanke has, who's a good friend, he and I have served in the administration here. He was working at the Council of the Economic Advisors. The, the problem is, how do you get off this QE3? Because when he announced he was going to taper, which means just not, not get out of it, not stop it, but move from maybe 85 billion uh, a month to 83 or 80 or something, a, a, a buying of these uh, mortgage-backed securities and of the treasuries, what happened? Well, the market, market shot out from under it. You know, it just it it it. And Ben is a believer in transparency. Big debate among monetary economists: should you be transparent or not? Greenspan never liked transparency. <clears throat> If you're transparent, you lose some power. The markets know what you're going to do. And what Ben found out, as soon as he announced the tapering, what happened? There wasn't a gradual taper. The market just shot down. It went to where he said he wanted to take it. Mm -hmm. Right away. Instantly. So uh, I'm sympathetic with, with what he did. I think he's, he's, he's been a good, good chairman. Uh, you asked about TARP. I was never a big fan of TARP. On the other hand, they had to do something back then in 2008. We were really over the edge. We were looking right into the chasm. And uh, we wouldn't have had, no, no bank would have been standing. Not Goldman Sachs, not J.P. Morgan, nobody was how bad, it, how bad it was. And if all your banks collapse, you can't have an economy to function. And the runs on the banks would have been extraordinary, and we would have been back in 19... 33 or something. So I think they had to do it. There were mistakes in the way it was done that you know, created uh, unnecessary uncertainty in the market by one day uh, propping up somebody and the next day letting somebody else go, the Lehman and versus Bear Stearns situation. On the other hand, overall, they had to do, they, they, they had to do what, what, what they did. What is uh, the, the stock market uh, has a rhythm of its own that I've never understood. <laughs> hey, Candy. John, is it my understanding that we raised the retirement age to 70, which we're right. all right around there right, right now, both of us are perfectly healthy. Would that solve, so then Medicare would kick in, would we be would that solve the problem? It, it would go a long way on Social Security. Yeah, it, it would go. It would go a long way. Uh, but you can't do it right away because so many people. You got to give people that time to plan their retirement. That's why it's been six months. You know, every decade. Uh, eventually, we should get. I think you said maybe people are living so much longer. Yeah, still so pretty out. And you look terrific. <laughs> <laughs> Last question. Yeah. Okay, go ahead. I wonder if I could ask you to tie together three things that you've mentioned. The 10 years on, uh, what is the effect on the deficit of the tax policies uh, that you helped bring in? And 10 years on, what is the effect on, on the middle class that you mentioned? The middle class. Um, what, what, what is it, 10 years on, what is the effect on those, on those two things, on those two things of that, on tax policy? Of the tax policy? And that is the last question. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think the, the uh, you can look it up in CBO and get, get their view of it. CBO, CBO, I think, calculates the ongoing costs of the Bush tax cuts. It's something like both the 01 and 03 tax cuts. It wasn't there or one. It was something like a trillion two over a 10 year period. Uh, the effects on the middle class, hard to say exactly, but uh, I've got a belief that, that, uh, that the middle class benefited at least during that period of time when I was there because there was something like six or seven million jobs created over a short period of time. And GDP. Uh, GDP began to grow at a, at a very good, very good clip. Uh, and when GDP is growing and jobs are being created, it's, it's the middle class that, 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 that benefits. Um, now, we've got a huge problem with 
stagnant wages and middle class, uh, the, the shrinking middle class, and the absence of opportunities for folks who don't have, don't get the great benefit of going to MSU or some other fine university. Because there's a, a real separation occurring in America between the fortunate and the, the, the less fortunate. And it's, it's striking. I saw a graph recently that shows from 1975 on what's happened to per capita productivity, which we normally think of as the driver of wages, right? That's, that's a classical economic theory is that as productivity goes up, wages go up. But what we found is that wages that haven't been going up and that compensation, it's understandable why wages aren't going up because employers are paying more in healthcare benefits and non-wage benefits. But then you ask the question, what's happened to total compensation? And total compensation itself is flat. So something is going on. Now, what, what is that? <coughs> I puzzle over it. I think what's going on is that, uh, and that's at the same time that uh, people in the most fortunate, uh, the most, the elite workers, call them the elite workers, whether they're baseball players or movie stars or lawyers or what, business executives, are finding their compensation go way up. Average is not. Now, why? What, what could be going on? I think what's going on is that with the fall of the, the wall, with, with China entering the capitalist market system, with Brazil opening up, with India opening up, what we found is there's something like six billion new workers in, in the global economy. And you say, well, they don't. Well, they absolutely do, because the products we produce here can be produced over there. And if they can be produced over there with wage rates that are much lower than ours, those wage rates will affect what happens in the United States. And our firms will move their workers out. And they'll move their work out and so on. We're, we're, we, we're in a whole new world than we were in 1975 because of the geopolitical changes and the fact that China, India, Brazil, and Malaysia, and Indonesia, and Vietnam are now part of the global economy, and those workers are affecting wage rates, wage rates here. Recently, a good development has occurred, and Montana's part of it. It's the emerging uh, shale gas, shale oil opportunities, which are making America you know, America now produces more energy than the Soviet Union, than Russia. And we're, we're finding that our, our energy costs here are much lower than the rest of the world. Well, what's happening as a result of that is that those firms that took their workers over to Indonesia or Malaysia or Vietnam or Cambodia are now bringing them back here because our, our, our energy advantage is so large. The bad thing about it is the workers that left, those jobs that left the United States 20 years ago at $80,000 a year or $70,000 a year or 60, are coming back at 35. That's, that's what's, what's happening. Now, the only answer I can see, uh, since productivity alone won't solve this problem, and, and uh, uh, Ed education alone probably won't solve it, although education, the one, one thing we do know is that people who are educated have higher, have higher compensation, have higher income. Uh, so get a college degree, get, get some education, get well trained in something, and your prospects are going to be much better than, much better than otherwise. But the other lesson of all this is that we may not be able to rely for a high standard of living on wages alone. So think about investing equity markets or investing in something that will grow because it looks like there's very significant downward pressure on wages, holding wage rates in check. Good, thank you.